Hi and welcome to this presentation on how to clinically reason your way through a cardiorespiratory physiotherapy patient encounter. In this presentation we are going to learn how to pull together all our assessment findings into a prioritised, justified problem list and discover how we can use that to select appropriate interventions and then evaluate the effectiveness of our intervention. You will find the attached document, Problem List Evidence and Treatments, invaluable in learning how each impairment is evidenced and treated. Let's go through this using a simple case study. Mrs McTavish is a 78-year-old lady who underwent a hemicolectomy yesterday. You are seeing her today for her initial assessment. She appears uncomfortable and is visibly grimacing as you walk into the room. When you ask her, she tells you her pain is 5 out of 10 at rest and 9 out of 10 if she tries to move. She has a morphine PCA, a patient-controlled analgesic. She is lying almost flat in bed, holding her stomach and is reluctant to move. Her heart rate and her blood pressure are slightly elevated, likely as a result of her pain levels. She also has a rapid, shallow breathing pattern, with some use of her accessory muscles. She tells you she feels she is struggling a bit with her breathing, but only rates it at a 3 out of 10 on the Borg dyspnea scale. On auscultation you find reduced breath sounds with some scattered expiratory crackles, and on palpation you find reduced basal expansion with some tactile fremitus in the upper zones. Mrs McTavish's cough is very weak and moist sounding. She is currently requiring 4 litres of oxygen via nasal prongs for an oxygen saturation rate of 95%. So what problems have we identified? Try pausing the video and writing what cardiorespiratory impairments you have identified in this patient. Okay, so our first step is to identify the impairments and how we know they exist. You know the patient is in pain because they have told you and because they look in pain. They also have an increased heart rate and blood pressure which can be a systemic response to a painful stimulus. We have observed accessory muscle use and the patient has rated shortness of breath of 3 out of 10 on the Borg dyspnea scale, so they have an element of dyspnea present, although likely small in this instance. There are reduced lung volumes, which we know from the reduced breath sounds and auscultation, the reduced expansion on palpation and the apical breathing pattern. The coarse crackles, tactile fremitus, and moist, ineffective cough are a good indicator the patient has impaired airway clearance. And the fact that they are requiring oxygen to keep their oxygen saturations above 95% demonstrates an impaired gas exchange. Now we have our impairments, how do we know where to start with our treatment? What is the most significant problem? If we ask the patient what do you think they would say is the most significant concern? I would guess pain in this situation, but imagine we had a patient with less pain and more breathlessness, what do you think they might report? Many will advocate that you address the patient's most significant symptom first. I disagree. I think you need to identify what is causing, or at the very least what is compounding, the other impairments. So in this situation I would argue that pain is the most significant impairment. Because the patient is in pain, she is unable to take deep breaths. This has likely exacerbated the reduced lung volumes that would be there in a way as a result of the surgery, but would be less significant if she wasn't in pain. Because of these reduced lung volumes and the inability to take a deep breath, she can't get air behind the secretions to clear them with a cough. The pain is also limiting the cough. This will compound the surgical effect of impaired mucociliary clearance and add significantly to the impaired airway clearance. Now we have collapsed mucus lined lungs, so less air will be able to get to the alveoli, so there is less surface area available to participate in gas exchange. This creates our gas exchange impairment, which leads directly to our dyspnea sensation, as the blood oxygen levels are low, signalling the body to increase rate and depth of ventilation. Pain is limiting depth at the base of the lungs, so the accessory muscles are being used to try and increase depth apically instead. So we can see here, if we're able to remove pain from this patient, her other impairments are likely to improve significantly. If we treat lung volumes, 
airway clearance will improve, if we treat airway clearance, gas exchange would improve. And it turns out dyspnea is a consequence of the above impairments, so if we treat them, it will improve. So why does it go on the list if it's going to be addressed by treatments for the other impairments? Because often it's the most significant issue from the patient perspective and there are strategies we can teach the patient to manage their dyspnea to make them more comfortable until, other patient, until the other impairments are resolved. Now, we haven't covered interventions yet, but with our theory knowledge and our problem list, we should be able to think of some strategies that would address each impairment. We will look at interventions in much more detail in the next presentation. So let's start with pain. Patient has a patient-controlled analgesic, so we'll have a button she can push whenever she's in pain. Some education might be all that is required here. Find out how often she is pushing it, and if not frequently, then why not? It might just be that she is scared that she will take too much, and reassurance might be all that is required. Or it might be that she feels she can handle the pain. This is an education opportunity. She needs to understand the risks associated with not being able to take a deep breath or to mobilise. Educate her that she needs to press the button every five minutes as the dose becomes available, until she is able to take a deep breath and to move in the bed. If this is not sufficient, Maybe the patient is using their maximum and still in pain, or maybe it is making them feel too drowsy. They would benefit from review from the acute pain team. Contact the medical team to discuss. For patients who are not on a PCA, it might be as simple as requesting pain meds from the nurse and educating the patient about requesting meds and not waiting to be offered. In a surgical patient, you will also want to teach them wound support, where they use a rolled up towel or pillow and hold over their wound as they cough. This splints the wound and makes the cough less painful. Then with lung volumes we would use positioning, mobilisation and potentially thoracic expansion exercises to increase air into the bases of the lungs. For impaired airway clearance, we would again get benefit from positioning and mobilisation and may wish to utilise the active cycle of breathing technique to clear the lungs. We would need to optimise oxygenation of the patient and advise on the best positioning to promote gas exchange and teach management strategies for breathlessness. The final step is to evaluate that intervention. To do that, you need to revisit the outcome measures that you use to determine that your patient has impairments on initial assessment. So for this patient, we would re-evaluate her pain scores to determine effectiveness of our pain intervention. We would re-auscultate and palpate to determine effectiveness of our interventions for reduced lung volumes and impaired airway clearance. We would be hoping to hear increased breath sounds and reduced crackles and feel increased expansion and reduced fremitus. For impaired gas exchange, we'd be looking at oxygen saturations and oxygen flow rate. And for dyspnea, we would reassess our Borg rating. Of course, we are hoping to determine that our interventions are effective. But if they are not, that is just as important to note. It means we need to adjust our interventions as the ones we have chosen are not right in this circumstance. It is always important to reflect on our effectiveness and to ensure to use this reflection to tailor our patient care. For example, a demonstration that upright positioning has improved oxygenation would lead me to leave the patient with advice that they should spend as long as possible sitting up out of bed. I would also want to go and communicate this to the nursing staff and document accordingly. That concludes this presentation on the clinical reasoning of the cardiorespiratory patient. I hope this has helped you form a clearer picture of how you identify impairments and then how you select treatments and evaluate the effectiveness of your intervention. In the next presentation on interventions, we will explore in much greater depth the treatment options available to you for each intervention.